Hello and welcome to the Medjlis Podcast, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty's current affairs talk show focusing on Central Asia. I'm Bruce Paneer, host of the Medjlis and author of the weekly Central Asia and Focus newsletter. The biggest influx of people into Central Asia possibly in history has been happening this year as tens of thousands of Russian citizens have been fleeing their country. The process started right after Russia began its war in Ukraine, but the quote, partial, unquote, mobilization of men announced by the Kremlin on September 21st has sent a new wave of Russian citizens into Central Asia. What do the people living in Central Asia think about this, and how is it affecting their lives? To discuss all this, I'm joined by Chani Bek Arinov, Assistant Professor at the Graduate School of Public Policy, Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. He works on topics related to international politics of Central Asia. Medit Tulegenov, Assistant Professor in the International and Comparative Politics Department at the American University of Central Asia in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. And hopefully shortly, we're going to be joined by Nikita Makarenko, who is a journalist from Uzbekistan. Thank you all for joining me. And I want to start with Johnny Beck. Johnny Beck, Kazakhstan shares a 7,000 kilometer long border with Russia. And according to some reports, more than 100,000 people from Russia have crossed that border into Kazakhstan in the last few days. What are people in the Kazakh capital saying about this? For sure, we see already the impact of uh, the people from, the economic at least impact of uh, the people coming from, from Kazakhstan. So I'm based in Astana. So as far as I can judge from my own uh, position, first of all, what we can see is that uh, the housing price uh, spiked uh, almost two, three times the thing. Uh, so now we have a lot of uh, lots of complaints about um, uh, the, the housing prices and people kind of uh, having troubles with finding apartments to rent. Uh, this is mostly about in Astana. I think I've also heard uh, something similar from people in Almaty and also from northern um, cities um, uh, that border uh, with with Russia. But in general, um, I mean, it's difficult to judge to what extent the people, uh, people in Kazakhstan, uh, what they think generally about uh, the situation going on here. So some people argue that it's a kind of benefit uh, for Kazakhstan, mostly in the sense that we are getting um, qualified workers in different fields, um, IT specialists, uh, doctors, and so on and so forth. Others claiming that uh, it gonna have, it's going to have some political consequences later, social economic plus political consequences. But as far as I can uh, judge from the from what government is saying and doing, the government is trying to create some conditions uh, that would allow uh, those people who are fleeing and the mobilization in Russia uh, just to have uh, to settle down here to have uh, to help them with this getting this uh, identification number with having shelters uh, so basically we don't see a kind of kind of welcoming signals i think from the government side but in society it seems to me that the opinions are a bit divided Okay, great. Thank you, Shani Beck. Uh, Medit, I have the same question for you, too. I mean, how, how has life been in Bishkek? You know, I, I already saw way back in March that all kinds of all kinds of Russian citizens were arriving. Um, what's the situation now? Do you notice, uh, is life different in the Kyrgyz capital? Yes, thanks, Bruce. And uh, as Shani Beck said, perhaps as for Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, it's uh, still new because uh, mobilization order was been just a few days ago and the uh, we yet to see what would happen in Kyrgyzstan. We are not, unlike Kazakhstan, adjacent to Russia. We don't have any proximate and immediate borders. But if Russians would and are coming to Kyrgyzstan, they do it by flying to Bishkek or maybe to Osh, to two cities where there are flight and airplane connections. And of course, uh, what I, as, uh, for example, um, person who is living in Bishkek can observe, it's uh, immediate maybe uh, certain change of scene when you see more Russians. Of course, it's a question quite often is that when you observe in streets of capital cities like Bishkek, Russians, local Russians versus Russians from Russia, but it's more or less visible. And that's, uh, I think that's, uh, that's quite noticeable. And uh, I think it's, it's been noticeable to some extent, maybe already in the past uh, few months and weeks, but maybe we can see more and more on that uh, of that uh, since it was uh, announced in Russia about uh, mobilization. And uh, I myself, for example, <laughs> just on Monday in Bishkek International Airport, I was uh, sending my friend off flying to further to Europe through Istanbul. And it was for me a very strange scene. I never seen, I myself find quite frequently, few 
times a year being in the airport, people which quite a strangely different enough, uh, which obviously from Russia, but also <laughs> I myself being a pet pet lover, mostly cats, but uh, I've seen quite a number of people with dogs which were flying. And seemingly it's uh, people who are coming from Russia and maybe in transit from Russia to Bishkek and then maybe somewhere else to Istanbul and further. But uh, I would imagine quite many of them are heading towards uh, Bishkek and as I've heard from some of my friends as well, not only to Bishkek, but also to some other uh, places in uh, Kyrgyzstan, like in Osh, and they're trying to settle, and that's quite often visible. Visible not only by what you see on the street, but also by, for example, what happens with the hotels. Uh, all of them are almost fully booked. Prices are going up uh, in hotel, and it's uh, not only hotel, but also in terms of uh, apartments which are being rent in Bishkek. Almost all of them are full, and uh, even there are a lot of, as I hear from people who I personally know, cases when some even uh, people who rent apartments are being evicted uh, in terms of prices being going up, and uh, new people are coming in, meaning that it's uh, because of the people who are coming from Russia, which are, well, in Russian it's called relakanti, who people are being relocated, and it's uh, one, of the, one of the effects. It's in terms of the rental prices and some... Uh, issues related to the hotel booking. Bruce, back to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Medit, let me have a follow-up question for you, and then and then I'll ask the same thing of Johnny Beck. But Medit, if you could tell me first, okay, we've we've heard about the increase in prices for uh, hotels and, and, and the uh, reduction in availability of flats around this place, but you know, there's also basic products, the stuff that you buy at the store. And we knew that there was going to be Already, there was reports about shortages of some basic good sugar, for instance, right? That there wasn't as much sugar as usual and the prices were going up. And generally, you know, prices, inflation has been uh, hitting Kyrgyzstan and, and Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan too. But, but is there, do you notice any scarcity of basic goods or anything? Or is, are the price, has the price of basic goods, flour, sugar, those kind of things, has it spiked recently? Yes, thanks, Bruce. Yeah, I myself who usually goes once or every second day to some shops, but not buying all of the stuff you just telling. I did notice anything which uh, seemingly has been an effect or or result effect or resulted uh, because of this influx of people who are coming from Russia. But at least I've seen on the social media that there are some people are commenting that uh, they go into the shop and, the, for example, they see the absence of certain specific products, which seemingly perhaps uh, a result of the certain preferences of food tastes of people who are coming from Russia. But it's uh, quite scarce in terms of such news. So uh, at the moment, I wouldn't say that it affected quite heavily in terms of the availability of products in uh, Bishkek shops. But again, as I'm saying, it's still fresh. It's uh, maybe the, as we speak, the phenomenon is still ongoing and maybe we will see that coming. But at the moment, I didn't notice anything like that. Johnny Beck. Uh, if you could tell me about, about uh, availability of food and basic goods in, in Kazakhstan, have you noticed increase in prices? Uh, is, it, is it harder to get some products than it used to be? The same as in Kyrgyzstan, as Milad mentioned. I personally haven't seen anything, kind of any shortages in terms of the products availability. Uh, some people were complaining, again, I saw this uh, in social media, complaining about uh, the prices uh, going up. Uh, but again, I, I think that started maybe a way before uh, this mobilization back in uh, March. And you mentioned the sugar and availability, especially in Kazakhstan. Uh, so, but again, that was uh, that started back uh, in spring. So, as far as we can judge now, again, again, I haven't seen anything uh, similar to that. So, shortages of uh, products. But uh, I had to fly to Almaty on Saturday, uh, but because of the, uh, there was no hotel rooms available for Friday, for tomorrow. And then we had to cancel our trip. Uh, so I think that's the uh, the most visible kind of uh, thing uh, so far we can observe here. The shortage of uh, hotel places, uh, flats, and so on. In terms of products, it seems to be more or less okay for now. Okay, well then let me ask you, a, a couple minutes ago you mentioned that um, some people see this as a positive, right? That they're going to have an IT specialist, that they're going to have doctors and people like that coming in. But there's, you know, there's people in, in Kazakhstan that can do these things too. Is there, do you notice any resentment, uh, you know, among the locals that, that you know, great, uh, you know, 
these people are qualified and, and educated, but you know, is is are people worried that there's going to be a stiffer competition for them to find jobs and that they might get pushed out by some of these newcomers? Uh, for sure, this kind of worries are there, and we can notice them, especially uh, on social media. You, maybe you've been following, but a couple of days, two years, two days ago. President Tokayev, while visiting Turkestan, Shimkan, he made a statement saying that we will do everything to help those people. And this created a kind of uh, pushback among certain uh, segments in population, arguing that uh, we should first help our citizens, uh, we should help our citizens first. This kind of moods are there. But and on the other hand, there are also the people who are arguing that, OK, this uh, people coming to Kazakhstan, they are well qualified. Uh, they can add to the economy of Kazakhstan. And this has been the general line uh, that we've been hearing from the government. The, the minister two days ago also mentioned that Kazakhstan will do uh, everything uh, to help those people to find a job. And then he was quick later to, to say that um, those jobs should be mostly in the public sector, but not in the governmental sector, because in the governmental sector, we give priority to our own citizens. Uh, and today we see another uh, minister for digital development going and visiting one of these um, service centers in Astana, Sons, uh, in Astana and um, talking to the Russians and uh, again saying that Kazakhstan will do everything to help those people to get this uh, identification numbers uh, so that they can register here and then find a job. So so this has been the main government, uh, governmental line. So we need to help those people and we will do our best to help those people. Okay, thank you, Johnny Beck. Okay, so Medit, I, I want to move over to you and, and kind of ask you the same question too Do you, uh, that I just asked for Johnny Beck. You know, there's... It, it, Good that you get these these qualified professionals coming in, but in the meantime, what about the local workforce? Are they are, are uh, how do they greeting this this influx of these educated and and IT specialists, people like that? Uh, is uh, is there any concern that that the job market is going to be thinned out a little bit if these people stay around for a while? Uh, no, I think there is no such apprehension in terms of incoming labor force all of a sudden will squeeze out local uh, labor no i think uh, just maybe the discourse goes in terms of uh, trying to see how it can be utilized and opportunities which should not be missed and often for example in social media you can see discussions uh, for example if people are coming in these various uh, businesses and it projects whether they can also try to integrate locally and try to employ local uh, labor and uh, that's what is more or less visible but in terms of the competition i think it's not the case and uh, when it comes to it especially for example but it happened even before this uh, latest mobilization decree uh, in august uh, kyrgyz government created so-called this uh, digital uh, nomad project where they try to create favorable conditions for it specialists from different countries, from CIS. They try to diffuse attention from Russia in that particular situation by putting all CIS, almost all CIS countries here. But anyway, it was uh, aimed at Russia. It was one of the examples how they try to lure and uh, attract uh, Kyrgyzstan as one of the places where IT specialists can come and uh, work under favorable conditions. So that's uh, one of the steps which government undertook uh, months ago before mobilization. But at the moment, I think it's there are no concerns in this regard because when it comes, for example, for IT and maybe some other sectors, uh, we don't see any uh, fear so strict competition in this regard, and uh, at least I myself have noticed any concerns on that on that issue. Great, thank you, Nikita. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. I'm so sorry for uh, the problem, but I'm here with you. Okay, no problem. You know, I, I want to get back to the the you were you were discussing you, what you were talking about just a few minutes ago because uh, it was an important point. You know, when I was asking how are how are people in Tashkent and, and other cities, big cities in Uzbekistan receiving this influx of Russian citizens. And you were talking about the fact that they, that, you know, Tashkent and Uzbekistan generally has seen this in historically before, uh, where they've had these large numbers of arrivals coming in, uh, World War II, you had mentioned. Um, but can you tell me a little bit about what the situation is now? How are people looking at this, uh, you know, people who have never been exposed to this kind of you know, exodus of people that that show up all of a sudden in Uzbekistan. What do they think about this? Yeah, 
there is a lot of mixed reactions and mixed feelings. So definitely there are some people who are aggressive. So they are aggressive in the face, so they can be rude on streets or in a shop, and they are definitely aggressive online. And in contra, there are some people who are really want to help them, and they organize a Telegram groups and channels, so they find some uh, real estate for them, uh, making food, schools, and whatever. And those two groups, they are battling with each other online. And as I told you, there are a lot of people who are neutral, who maybe don't like this Russian uh, wave, but they consider it is important to be hospital because it is a part of a Uzbek culture. So it's really, really mixed and the country is divided. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And I, I'm going to ask, let's see, the next question, Johnny Beck, I'm curious, what, uh, what's the feeling, you know, what, do you notice that, that the opinion about the Russian war in Ukraine, you know, is it, are more people starting to, can you see that more people are start, starting to side with Ukraine over this, over the, you know, this arrival of all these Russians? Has that changed the way people see the conflict between Russia or Russia's war in Ukraine? Are they, are they looking at it different now that a lot of Russians are showing up in Kazakhstan? Again, it's very difficult to judge at this point uh, whether it's uh, the people um, expressing solidarity with Ukraine, the number of the people is increasing or kind of saying the same. It's different, uh, di very difficult at this point. Uh, but I think that now at least, okay, if we can judge from social media, let's say, maybe from Facebook or from Twitter or the Kazakhstani segment of Facebook, Twitter, uh, it may give an impression, impression that uh, more and more people um, are expressing solidarity with Ukraine. Uh, but I'm not sure whether we can separate this to the general society, because uh, I don't think now many people discussing the war in Ukraine. I mean, compared to to February to March, I think now it's routinized. Uh, so and now, uh, I mean... Uh, people do not talk much about Ukraine. And whether this uh, inf uh, inflow of Russians uh, will uh, bring back the war to the agenda, I don't know yet, uh, maybe. But I would uh, expect personally, again, based on kind of subjective opinion, my own subjective opinion, I would expect that possibly yes, because at some point we may see some tensions uh, on uh, polit political issues, on the issues uh, related uh, to the northern uh, territories of Kazakhstan. So some kind of this incidents and accidents may kind of make some people to support more the Ukra uh, Ukrainian side rather than Russian. Uh, because uh, two days ago, for instance, there was a video, oh, I think it was yesterday, uh, there was a video... Uh, one a blogger from one of the northern um, cities in Kazakhstan. He was kind of uh, asking uh, Russians a question uh, to whom the Crimea belongs, to whom the Pavlodar region belongs, and so on and so forth. I think it's a kind of... Uh, and then those people on video, the Russians, they were having a problem uh, to give a direct answer. Of course, uh, this kind of uh, incidents uh, trigger... Uh, suspicion towards uh, those Russians coming to Kazakhstan among certain segments uh, in Kazakhstani society. Of course, uh, this kind of incidents will uh, happen in the future. Uh, and I personally expect that um, possibly this may uh, shift some people to, to show more support uh, towards Ukraine than, uh, rather than Russia. Uh, and the second thing is uh, we now have a chance to listen to the personal stories of those Russians coming to Kazakhstan. Whether they support uh, the war, whether they oppose the war, but anyway, yesterday I was uh, having a chat with a colleague who is hosting six uh, scholars uh, from Bashkortostan. They also arrived this week. And again, uh, they have different stories to tell about the war, about their personal stories, how they uh, left the country, uh, how they felt threatened. And this kind of things maybe will increase sympathy towards uh, Ukraine in this war, maybe a kind of negative sentiments towards the Putin regime and uh, towards Russia. So this through this kind of individual stories, maybe I mean, we'll get more information on more personal uh, insights from the people.
No, this is a good point, and I want to follow up on it. But we have reached the halfway point in the show, so I have to do my usual promo here. This is a reminder that this is the Medjlis Podcast, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty's weekly current affairs talk show focusing on Central Asia. Uh, we are discussing the mass arrival of Russian citizens to Central Asia and how the people of Central Asia view the flood of foreigners coming to their countries. Joined today by Medit uh, Tulegeno, assistant professor at, in the International and Comparative Politics Department at the American University of Central Asia in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. Nikita Makarenko, a journalist from Uzbekistan. Johnny Bekarinov, assistant professor at the Graduate School of Public Policy, Nazarbayev University, Kazakhstan. He works on topics related to the international politics of Central Asia. Okay, Nikita, I'm going to ask you a question, and, and uh, then I'm going to ask you the same question, Meta, but I'll start with Nikita. You know, for years I've been hearing this thing about, Ru- you know, the image of Russia as like the big brother in Central Asia, right? You hear all these you know, really kind of derogatory statements and stuff about Central Asia being Russia's backyard and or Russia being the guarantor of security or something like that for Central Asia. Have you noticed that that, that view has, has changed? I mean, is there a lot more pushback against that those kind of uh, uh, statements, that, that kind of image? Are, pe- are people looking at Russia now with, with, I hate to say less respect, but certainly less, less fear uh, in Uzbekistan? Yes, for sure, uh, the war has changed a lot. And especially among intelligent people, among people who are not influenced by Russian TV and propaganda, among thinkers and uh, people oriented to build a strong nation. But we can't say about majority. And maybe it's not even a majority, it's a small minority. Unfortunately, the majority of people are hardly influenced by Russian propaganda, and uh, it is, I consider, a question of a national security. Uh, Because, yes, the war uh, has helped us to open some eyes uh, towards what is Russia is. But at the same time, the amount of propaganda on Russian TV and in the media uh, about the war, the war content, it's doubled. Now it's crazy, overheat, and people in Uzbekistan are influenced by this war propaganda too, and a lot of them actively support the war. So the war uh, helped us to open some eyes, but we didn't win a battle yet, not even the war. Okay, and Bet, uh, the, pretty much the same question to you: Has the image of Russia, the big brother, taken a taken a hit from the, uh, these last few over these last few months? When it's been apparent that even in Russia, there's a lot of people who who don't support the war and that certainly don't want to go and fight in the war in Ukraine. Yeah, and uh, just to answer your question, Bruce. Yeah, I think that's indeed what's interesting for me, but maybe I'm my, in my own bubble connected to whomever I'm liking and following in my social media, but uh, generally I think there are certain trends which I'm observing that uh, there are certain changes since the start of the war, and maybe also depending on the relative perception of uh, whether Russia def- winning or defeating, which <laughs> rather in... <sighs> Recent times, more like the latter, that the Russia seems like to be uh, being defeated than winning in this war. There is a certain change of perception. And uh, in what we're discussing now with this uh, influx of Russians because of the mobilization, there is also a change in terms of perception. And not, not necessarily the big change, but maybe accentuation of certain specific moments of how people or certain segments of people in our society in Central Asia or in Kyrgyzstan particularly they reflect how they perceive Russia and uh, this uh, as scholars can put it maybe post-colonial thinking or discussion and how they perceive what it is Russia and how Russia can be treated, even maybe even the name, for example, how are the people who are coming because of this uh, mobilization order, which happened to be in Russia, how they should be called. Some people call, call them relocante or people who are relocated, as I some, myself sometimes call them, or people who have a bit of a less flattering term like a mobiki, people who are just being mobilized and they're trying to f- flee from mobilization. I think this, even this kind of a naming it, themselves it, itself is a reflection of how it's uh, how it uh, maybe how people in, in Kyrgyzstan for example 
by choosing whatever they want to use as a name for people who are coming to Russia that uh, reflects the attitude to Russia in general. I think that also triggers a lot of discussion which has been even looming uh, generally and has been latent uh, even before invasion of Ukraine, but now all of a sudden with the invasion of Ukraine, but now with the face with after invasion of Ukraine with this influx of people who are fleeing from mobilization, it's triggered a lot of discussion in regard to imperial past, it's a post-imperial current, and how to treat people who live together. Kyrgyz ethnically, who live with Russians who are Kyrgyz citizens nearby, and greeting Russians who are not Kyrgyz citizens but coming in and how they should behave in regard to each other. And even uh, when it comes to Kyrgyzstan, I know how it happens in other countries. For example, how... For example, people call Kyrgyzstan, is it Kyrgyzia, as people who know and who listen now, for example, podcast, uh, knows a little bit of Russian, is how Kyrgyzstan is often called, should it be called Kyrgyzia or Kyrgyzstan, it's often the point of contention in regard to how people are talking in social media to people from Russia who are coming to Kyrgyzstan, and that also often becomes a contentious point in regard to Are people having certain imperial or post-imperial mindset or is they trying to change uh, the attitude towards the current situation and they tr should try to adapt uh, to the circumstances which are, which are we having nowadays and uh, see how people from countries like Kyrgyzstan see past and see what happens nowadays in regard to relationship between Kyrgyzstan and Russia. And that is affecting quite a lot uh, I think the the uh, the points of uh, I think interaction between people in Kyrgyzstan and uh, people who come from Russia. But again, as I said in the beginning, it often it's uh, based on my reflection what is happening on the certain specific segments of uh, social media which I'm particularly following in, which of course is not very much representative of the whole society. Thank you very much. Okay, Johnny Beck, I have a question for you because you mentioned a few minutes ago, you know, that, that there had been Russian officials that had made statements about perhaps, you know, parts of northern Kazakhstan were historically Russian lands. And, and some even went a lot further and said maybe all of Kazakhstan was historical Russian land. And now that you have this influx of Russians coming across the border that are fleeing Russia, and we see that Russia is having a very hard, the Russian military is having a very difficult time in Ukraine. Is, is there a sense of relief on the part of anybody and some people in Kazakhstan that Russia is not the threat it was uh, just a few months ago? Okay, I, I can judge uh, from the, again, bubble where... I belong to mostly, right? So we've been discussing with colleagues possibly and kind of several times that possibly, yes, now we are in a better position that we used to be, for instance, before February. And then in that sense, Ukraine is not just fighting for uh, fighting for its own independence uh, or sovereignty, let's say. And then uh, it's also finding, uh, fighting, first of all, for Kazakhstan's sovereignty. Uh, so in that sense, yes, at least at the, uh, among the expert community, we can uh, see this kind of uh, discussions. Uh, when it comes to the population, I think it's it's very much divided, uh, and and then the, the the scale of this division is still unclear personally to me. And we also have the similar kind of discussions in society among the general population, uh, whether uh, we should uh, again the similar to what Milet has been saying uh, that Kyrgyzstan or uh, Kyrgyz. In the case of Kazakhstan, we have um, the Tenge or Tenge, uh, as uh, Russians would say, or Almaty or Alma Ata, uh, Takayev or Tokayev. And we see this kind of discussion of points of contestation um, uh, a lot uh, among the um, among the population, I think, especially uh, in social media. But again, uh, we should be uh, very realistic about the fact that I don't think that the majority still, uh, in Kazakhstan at least, uh, support Russia. They, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, majority, I don't think that the majority support Ukraine in this war. I think we still have this uh, huge portion of population who are affected by partly by the russian propaganda partly by uh, by other factors and the the recent survey the study uh, in kazakhstan done by central asia barometer shows that only 20% i think it was about 25% of the population in kazakhstan think that russia is behind uh, this war uh, it's russia to be blamed 
and about 45 percent uh, think that it's Ukraine and Western uh, countries to be blamed uh, for this war. Uh, so in that sense, again, uh, the situation I think in Kazakhstan is a bit different compared to Uzbekistan. Maybe also is uh, slightly different from what we can see in Kyrgyzstan. So in that sense, I think the society in Kazakhstan is more divided uh, than in Uzbekistan, uh, maybe than even in, in Kyrgyzstan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nikita, Johnny Beck raises an interesting point, you know, simply the, the language that we're using, right? That How they pronounce words, Almaty, Almata, uh, you know, and, and Medit mentioned too, Kyrgyzstan or, or Kyrgyzia or something. When the Russians are coming to Uzbekistan, have you have you any information or have you noticed that while, while I agree that hospitality is, is one of the things that Central Asia is is known for uh, in all the Central Asian countries, but is there is there an understanding that, fine, the Russians are here, but you're living by our rules now? So it's widely discussed nowadays in Twitter and other social networks. Recently, there was uh, a few uh, posts from a very popular bloggers because, unfortunately, I can't say for all of them, but many Russians which are coming here to Tashkent their attitude is still very colonial. And especially when it comes to language, they demand to speak in Russian from taxi drivers, from bank accountants. And there were a lot of screenshots from different Telegram groups where those Russians are exchanging messages and they say, we want to uh, give our kids to school, but they want us to learn Uzbek in those schools. And we do not want how we can apply to get rid of Uzbek in our schools. So those attitudes for sure do not make uh, locals happy. And unfortunately, I expect that those Russians which will decide to stay in Tashkent, they will come together to uh, some kind of diaspora. And I'm still not sure what are their values. Are they really against the war or, or they will be used somehow indirectly by Russia to push on this idea of uh, Russian world and to push on Uzbek government more and more? Great, thank you very much. Okay, we're we're coming toward the final uh, final question of the uh, of the bro the podcast, and so I'm going to ask all of you to speculate a little bit. I'll start with Johnny Beck. Johnny Beck, you had a, a, thre a thread on Twitter the other day um, where you were saying that you you thought that maybe the longer this went on and the, and the longer those Russians stayed in Kazakhstan, and of course most of them, let's make it clear that a lot of these people, as, as Medit had mentioned, are really transiting. They can't get on flights in Russia to get to places that they want to go, so they're coming to Central Asian countries and moving on to other places, Turkey, the uh, Arab countries, somewhere like that. Um, but you said that you, uh, you wrote on Twitter that you thought that the longer this goes on and that these Russians stay along, that there would be a lot less sympathy for them over time. Do you, do you think, can you... Talk about that a little bit. I mean, what 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 do you foresee happening if this situation does not clear itself up? If Russia is still at war in Ukraine and people are still coming from Russia into Kazakhstan six months from now, a year from now, how do you see that playing out? Again, it's just a kind of pure speculation. And then and I do agree that a lot of people using Kazakhstan as a kind of transit country because, again, there are a limited number of flights from Russia. So they come, they cross the border by landing Kazakhstan and then from Kazakhstan they take flights to other places so again a couple of days ago the Minister of Internal Affairs was uh, reporting that 40,000 uh, people had already left the country uh, so yeah I mean it's 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 a, a big number right so everything will depend as when it comes to your question everything will depend on the scale so we don't know yet what's going to happen in coming weeks uh, whether Russia will close the border uh, from inside so today we had a reporting that Russia uh, was about to um, put a kind of checkpoint uh, checkpoint on its part of the uh, border just uh, to check whether to stop the people, some of the people who uh, need to be mobilized. So if they close the border from inside, maybe the, the scale will be smaller. If they ke uh, keep the border open, possibly we will see more people uh, coming to Kazakhstan. 
and maybe some of them will be leaving uh, to other places some of them will be staying here uh, so and then again it all depends on which uh, cities they go i think now as far as we can judge for now so uh, the basic uh, points in kazakhstan astana almaty almaty astana and then a few uh, northern parts uh, um, uh, northern cities like uh, like uralsk uh, akhtobe pavlodar and kostanay right so again uh, everything will depend on numbers and but again if those people coming to Kazakhstan as to, to stay here for a longer period, at some point they have to find, uh, look for jobs, right? At some point they have to bring their families. At some point they have to uh, solve the issues with with schools, with with kindergartens, with health, access to healthcare system, uh, with other kind of things. I mean, the, all this social um, kind of, uh, the, the social things, they, they require uh, quite I'm not sure to what extent uh, Kazakhstan has capacity to accommodate all people coming to Kazakhstan. The second thing is, uh, again, uh, there have been rep- reports on to, uh, in, in social media uh, about the kind of conflicts, the physical conflicts between uh, local people and uh, others coming, uh, the, the Russians coming to Kazakhstan. I think today I saw one, again, I'm not sure to what extent we can trust uh, this reporting, but still, uh, someone was reporting about an incident happened in Almaty, so I think locals were quite aggressive towards ethnic Russians, and then those ethnic Russians uh, were found to be local Russians, uh, not the, those coming from Russia. Again, this kind of incidents uh, will happen, it's inevitable. And also, uh, again, uh, Nikita mentioned this um, the Telegram group Groups that uh, te- Telegram groups where we see a kind of attitude, imperialistic attitude from certain uh, Russians uh, about Kazakhstan, about Kyrgyzstan, about other places. Again, uh, the society is quite sensitive to those kind of issues. And if those things uh, will grow in number, those kind of things will grow in number. It will inevitably, uh, I think, lead uh, to a kind of societal tensions uh, in Kazakhstan. So. Yeah, past potentially we may see those kind of negative things, but it will depend on the scale, how many people we will have from Russia and how we, the government will be able to solve the issues uh, related uh, to them. Good. Thank you very much. Nikita, I'll come over to you. Hospitality is great, but it has its limits. People are predicting a long conflict in, in, in Ukraine uh, with the Russian military. Uh, how long can the Uzbek people be hospitable? to these newcomers? Well, it really depends on how and in what proportion uh, those Russian wave will want to integrate into Uzbek society. And my experience says that they would not want to integrate, which will definitely cause some conflicts and tensions. Good news is that personally, I think that just a minority out of them is considering Tashkent or other cities of Uzbekistan as a place for a permanent residence. For the majority, and I think like for 95%, it's just a place to stay for a few months or just a place to jump to other cities like Istanbul or Europe or New York, whatever. So I do not think that now, a lot of them will stay and reside in Tashkent, but definitely I do not expect also from them that they will want to integrate even our local Russian-speaking diaspora, which been born in Tashkent and in other cities, they do not want to integrate. We have a lot of problems with learning Uzbek language and other issues, so in this situation you can't expect that strangers will start to learn Uzbek or will do some steps to be integrated into the society. Without these tensions are coming. This is uh, not a secret. Okay, great. Thank you. And Medit, I'm going to leave you with the last word. People in Kyrgyzstan seem to be, uh, well, you know, if not welcoming the Russians, at least uh, tolerant of the fact that they're, they're coming. How long do you think that can last before people start to think that maybe they should move on or uh, they, they don't want to be, they don't want to have a, uh, you know, an extra 50,000 Russian citizens living in Kyrgyzstan on a long-term basis? Well, I guess uh, it will depend on the size and scale of influx and maybe how long it will last. And as my colleagues Nikita and Genevieve mentioned, uh, whether it will be final point destination or just maybe transit point. And uh, it depends uh, on the perception, whether certain possible expected benefits in terms of possible jobs or whatever comes 
with influx of uh, these people to Kyrgyzstan, would be compared to other maybe side effects, which are negative side effects, which uh, are already observable. For example, increase of rental price, which we discussed in the beginning of our show, or maybe some other potential side effects. And that, I think, comparison may lead to the perception of how to treat that. And that will also come uh, along with uh, some more less tangible uh, effects like what we discussed already in terms of how people are being uh, adapted and uh, integrated. Do they want to integrate? I was running this morning uh, <laughs> in some parts of city. I was thinking, would we have another Brighton beach? But uh, perhaps not, because it's not like a long-term... Uh, of course, it's not quite clear what would happen in Russia, how long, and then to what extent Rilakante will be becoming emigrante, meaning that it's not temporary exile, but uh, maybe more or less permanent. But whether this permanency will be residing in Kyrgyzstan or it's just Kyrgyzstan becoming transit point. So many things are still not clear because it's still fresh, it's still ongoing. And in that sense, it's uh, not quite clear uh, what the situation will be, but I would expect that the situation... The perception of people in Kyrgyzstan will depend on that. I think first how economically and materially is this influx of Russians from Russia would affect them personally uh, in many parts of uh, Kyrgyzstan, at this point mostly in big cities like Bishkek and Osh. But then maybe how it would affect the general perception of the situation and uh, relationship between Kyrgyzstan and Russia in terms of how colonial, imperial, post-imperial and then uh, what uh, Rush, what Kyrgyzstan would uh, see itself, how it would see itself in terms of this uh, general situation of war with of Russia with Ukraine, and how that uh, would affect general attitude towards Russia, and then maybe to Russians fleeing from Russia. I think that's uh, what would uh, make uh, and what would shape the mindset in Kyrgyz in Kyrgyzstan. Great. great. Well, thank you very much. And, and, you know, I could go on for another hour talking about this topic. And, and I'd love to hear more comments from you. But unfortunately, we do have a limit on how long we're supposed to do this show. So I'm going to have to stop it here and um, say thank you to Nikita, Janibek, and Medit for joining me today on the program. Uh, and a big thank you, of course, to Nathan Shoemaker, our Medjolies podcast producer. He's usually in Washington, D.C., but currently in Prague. And a reminder, you can subscribe to the Medjolies podcast or the Central Asian Focus newsletter by visiting RFARL's website at rfarl.org. Thank you very much, and we'll be back next week. Bye-bye.